All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Friday Virtual Histories program. I'm Margaret Stella Malikian, and I'm with Baltimore Architecture Foundation. In 2020, Baltimore Heritage and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation partnered to host these virtual histories every other Friday. First, I'd like to thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support enables us to, uh, to continue these talks. A few announcements before we start. This program will be recorded and available on the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube channel early next week. On Friday, August 19th, please join us for the second half of today's presentation on the life and work of Goldie Hirsch. Now today's presentation. We'll highlight the research and documentation undertaken by EHT Traceries during the preparation of the National Register Multiple Property Document Documentation Form, Women in Maryland Architecture, 1920 to 1970. The Multiple Property Documentation Form prepared uh, through the Historic Preservation Non-Capital Grant Program awarded to BAF by the Maryland Historical Trust examines the careers of women designers, including architects, landscape architects, and artists in Maryland who were active between 1920 and 1970 and uh, situates their stories within this broader national context. About today's present, uh, presenter, John, John Gentry is a uh, senior architectural historian at EH Traceries Inc. and a historic preservation, uh, a historic preservation consulting firm based in Washington, DC. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from DePaul University and a Master's in Historic Preservation from the University of Maryland College Park. As an architectural historian and cultural resource management professional, John is experienced in researching, documenting, and assessing historic buildings and landscapes. He has successfully listed individual properties and districts on the National Register of Historic Places and other local uh, landmark registries in Maryland, the District of Columbia, Virginia, and several other U.S. states. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A box, and I will read them at the end. And with that, take it away, John. Okay, thank you. Let me see if I can do this without any unforeseen technical issues. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good summer. My name is John Gentry. As Margaret said, I'm a senior architectural historian with EHT Traceries Incorporated. Today, we're going to be discussing the history of women in architecture, focusing on Maryland, but also situating the topic within the broader national context and the themes that shaped women's experiences as architects during the 20th century. As a bit of project background, Traceries was retained by the Baltimore Architectural Foundation in 2021 <clears throat> under a Maryland Historical Trust Historic Preservation Non-Capital Grant to prepare a National Register Multi-Property Documentation Form, or MPDF, exploring the theme of women design professionals in Maryland during the period 1920 to 1970. In an MPDF, the themes, trends, and patterns of history shared by a group of related properties, such as buildings in Maryland designed by women, or, or, or are organized into historic contexts, and the property types that represent these historic contexts are defined. The MPDF is a cover document and not a nomination in its own right, but it serves as a basis for evaluating the National Register eligibility of related properties. It may be useful to nominate it may be used to nominate and register thematically related historic properties simultaneously or to establish the registration requirements for properties that may be nominated in the future. In preparing the MPDF, traceries built upon the research undertaken by Jillian Storms and others for the 2016 exhibit, Early Women of Architecture in Maryland, collectively identifying 97 properties, designed landscapes, and works of public art by 17 women. It is our hope that this research will generate more awareness about this topic and will lead others to make new discoveries and prepare nominations for buildings in Maryland designed by women. This presentation will not attempt to cover all of the women included in the MPDF, many of which have been the subject of past presentations. Challenging traditional gender roles and the limitations placed upon them by society. <clears throat> women contributed significantly to the built environment of Maryland during the period extending from 1920 to 1970. 
as a precursor to our discussion of the history of women architects in Maryland, we will first briefly look at the environment of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and the achievements of early pioneering women architects. We will next look at the period from 1920 to 1945 in Maryland. By the 1920s, women such as Gertrude Sawyer <clears throat> were beginning to design for wealthy Maryland clients, although women still faced considerable challenges in making inroads into what was still a male-dominated field. We will look at some of the work done by women during this period to better understand the ways in which they were able to navigate the restrictive social norms of the era and to illustrate the themes that shaped architecture, landscape architecture, and public art in Maryland before 1945. We will also consider the period from 1945 to 1970. Women during this period slowly broke down barriers and witnessed greater acceptance and participation in organization, organizations such as the American Institute of Architects. Uh, this period also coincided with the height of the modern movement and women architects worked at the forefront of the changing direction in American architecture. The post-war era also saw the rise of greater social and political con consciousness in the emergence of the feminist movement which in the design fields resulted in the questioning of gender roles, demands for greater equality in the workplace, and the first efforts to document the historical role of women in architecture and allied fields. Several women of European birth and training immigrated to Maryland during the post-war era and practiced architecture in the state, a theme which we will also briefly examine. By the second half of the 19th century, women in the US were beginning to move beyond traditional roles and were increasingly asserting themselves in the social, political, and occupational spheres. In 1868, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology became the first recognized school of architecture in the US, and by 1890 had produced its first female graduate, Sophia Hayden. In 1888, New York architect Louise Blanchard Bethune became the first woman to be accepted as a member of the AIA, and in 1889 was the first woman to become a fellow in the organization. By 1910, there were approximately 50 trained female architects in the US. Louise Blanchard Bethune, Julia Morgan, Minerva Parker Nichols, and Marion Mahoney Griffin were among the most successful and influential women architects practicing at this time. Yet, most architecture programs continued to deny admission to women, and women were often denied employment in established architectural firms. While most of the country's colleges and universities did not admit women students into their architectural programs, educational opportunities did exist for women seeking to begin a career in architecture during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Cooper Union in New York, established in 1859, from its inception allowed female students to enroll in its architectural design and engineering courses. In 1868, MIT became the first recognized school of architecture in the US. In addition, Cornell and Syracuse universities began accepting women into their newly established architecture schools in 1871, followed by the University of Illinois in 1873. Harvard professor Henry Atherton Frost established the Cambridge School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture in 1916, and it was the first institution to offer training exclusively to women. Harvard University did not accept female architecture students until 1942, when its architecture program merged with the Cambridge School Columbia University School of Architecture, founded in 1881, also denied female applicants, and it was not until 1913 that Marcia Mead became its first female graduate. In Baltimore, the Maryland Institute for the Promotion of Mechanic Arts opened in 1851 and offered classes in sketching and ornamental design, architecture, and engineering, although women were discouraged from pursuing the latter two fields of study. The World's Columbian Exposition held in Chicago in 1893 was an important event in the history of women in architecture. In 1891, the fair's organizers and planners, which included architect Daniel Burnham and wealthy Chicagoan Bertha Palmer, announced a competition open only to women architects for the design of the women's building. The idea to construct a women's building had been conceived by Susan B. Anthony and other notable women who persuaded Congress to include it in the fair. The design competition had a six week deadline and entrants were required to provide a statement of their qualifications. Of the 13 submissions received from around the country, the judges in 1891 selected the design prepared by Sophia Hayden, who was awarded the $1,000 prize plus expenses. Sophia Hayden's Renaissance Revival style design featured ionic columns, 
rows of Corinthian order pilasters and a classically derived entablature. The building received praise, but also criticism from some quarters after Hayden, a 22-year-old MIT graduate with little field experience working with contractors, suffered a nervous breakdown during the building's construction, eliciting the familiar questioning of whether women were suitable for work in the profession. Nevertheless, the World's Columbian Exposition was an event of singular importance within the early history of women in architecture, and it showcased the talents of emerging female practitioners in a very visible and public way. With these advancements by women architects on our national stage, women in Maryland were also beginning to venture into the architectural profession. The story of Anna L. Hawkins is a testament to the talents of early women architects and the challenges they faced in securing an education and establishing their careers. Hawkins was born into a Harford County farm family in 1868. With aid from local physician, Dr. John Miller Finney of Bel Air, Hawkins enrolled in the Maryland Institute of Art and Design in 1890 and in 1894 was the first female graduate of the school's architecture program. When she initially indicated her interest in pursuing a career as an architect, she was discouraged from doing so by the school's faculty who were concerned for her prospects in the male dominated field. Hawkins was determined, however, and was inspired by Sophia Hayden and her design selected for the Women's Pavilion at the World's Columbian Exposition. Anna L. Hawkins gained national attention when in June of 1896, the Maryland State Department of Education accepted her design for the new Haverford Grace High School in Harford County. Hawkins was one of several architects who entered the competition, was the only woman to do so. The school, <clears throat> no longer extant, was located at the corner of Congress and Adams Street in Haverford Grace. The news of Hawkins winning design at a time when few women practiced architecture in the US was reported in newspapers across the country from the Wilkes-Barre Times leader to the San Francisco Chronicle. Yet, despite this breakthrough, it appears that Hawkins was unable to establish a successful professional career as an architect, much like her role model, Sophia Hayden, who married several years after the Columbian Exposition and led a quiet life as an artist and housewife. While the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920 represented a significant breakthrough for greater gender equality, women continued to struggle against male dominance in the professional sphere. This was not only true of the design field, but also in other areas such as law, medicine, business, and higher education. Large firms in Baltimore and Washington, DC were led and staffed by men, as was the supervising architect's office of the Department of the Treasury, the principal designer of federal buildings. The Baltimore chapter of the AIA was established in 1870 and by the 1920s, it was still composed exclusively of male members whose ranks included some of the city's most prominent architects. There were no women members of the, of the Baltimore chapter until after World War II. As discussed in the introduction, women architects found ways to navigate the conservative professional environment of the pre-World War II era. Washington DC architect Gertrude Sawyer, an Illinois native and a 1922 graduate at, the Cam at Cambridge School, established a network of wealthy clients in Washington and Eastern Maryland who sought out her knowledge of colonial period architecture and landscapes. Her colleague and frequent collaborator, landscape architect Rose Greeley, was also an early Cambridge School graduate and followed a similar career path. Sawyer and Greeley practiced during the height of the country place era from 1890 to 1940, a period when large pastoral estates and with many outbuildings and elaborate gardens were being planned and constructed by America's elite. In 1932, Sawyer began work on a master plan for Point Farm, the country estate of Jefferson Patterson and his wife Mary, located in Calvert County near St. Leonard on a 512 acre property overlooking the Patuxent River. Patterson had envisioned a working model farm where he could raise prize cattle. Gertrude Sawyer developed an overall master plan for the estate and designed more than 20 new buildings in addition to renovating existing buildings. The brick two and a half story colonial revival style main residence designed by Sawyer between 1932 and 1934 features a five bay facade with a central gabled portico and classically detailed interior. Rose Greeley prepared the landscape plan for the Patterson estate, which was later altered by Carrie Milholland Parker. Also during this period, <clears throat> There was a growing interest in restoration and, rehab and the rehabilitation of historic properties and estates. 
some of which was undertaken by women architects and landscape architects. This coincided with a strong interest in the history and the architecture of the colonial period that surfaced along the Eastern seaboard alongside the nascent preservation movement, which women played a key role in. Gertrude Sawyer worked on several historic properties in Eastern Maryland, overseeing restoration activities and designing new buildings and additions. At Cremona and St. Mary's County, Sawyer undertook the restoration of the main house and the reconstruction of several outbuildings on the property. These included an ice house and smokehouse using brick from the, from the main house, a frame dairy, a frame overseer's house, and a barn based on an original located at Mount Vernon. Rose Greeley was an important early American landscape architect who designed formal gardens throughout Maryland, working primarily during the first half of the 20th century. She was a 1919 graduate of the Cambridge School. For one of her earlier projects in Maryland, Greeley designed a garden for the Chevy Chase residence of Mr. and Mrs. Whitman Cross at, 1000, at 101 East Kirk Street between 1924 and 1929. The design expresses Greeley's conviction that a garden should appear only as an incident in the larger landscape. The design incorporates walls, steps, pools, fountains, and terraces, all elements seen in many of Greeley's gardens. Public art represented another avenue through which women could contribute to the architectural arts. Art has historically been integrated into public and institutional architecture, from murals and mosaics to works of sculpture. After 1925 and the Paris Exposition, a new artistic direction burgeoned on both sides of the Atlantic that paralleled the rise of the Art Deco style, synthesizing classical composition, modernist simplification of form, streamlining, and the Parisian-inspired ornamentation. In 1929, New York artist Hildreth Meyer prepared a mosaic design for the banking hall floor of the Art Deco style Baltimore Trust Company. Designed by Taylor and Fisher architects, the intricate design features figurative, animal, and geometric motifs rendered in a style suggestive of ancient Roman mosaics that complements the Italian Renaissance inspired interior of the banking hall. Writing to a friend in 1936, she stated that, quote, it drives me wild to be spoken of as one of the best women artists. I've worked as an equal with men and my rating as an equal is all that I value. Victorine dupont Homsey and her husband, Samuel Homsey, established an architectural practice in Wilmington, Delaware in 1935. These husband and wife partnerships were another strategy through which women could find success as architects in the male dominated career environment that existed prior to World War II. The Homsies designed in the colonial revival style at times, but primarily were known as modernists who explored the emerging international style that heralded a new direction in architecture during the 1930s, both in the US and in Europe. One of the most noteworthy Maryland projects of the Homsies was the Cambridge Yacht Club, constructed between 1936 and 1937, with an addition to the club in 1939. For the club, the Homsies created a streamlined, nautically inspired design with curved building form, round porthole windows, and an upper deck with steel railing, much like that of a ship. The Yacht Club was featured in architectural form in 1938. It also received awards from the Maryland Society of Architects and the Architectural League of New York. Unfortunately, the club building has also been altered considerably in recent years and today only marginally reflects the Hamsi's original design. Public works projects sponsored by New Deal programs represented another avenue for women architects in Maryland. Pictured as the Rock Creek Field House in Bethesda, which was designed by Catherine Cutler Ficken, working in collaboration with her father, Montgomery County architect Howard Cutler. The field house was developed by the Maryland National Park and Planning Commission and was built by workers of the Civilian Conservation Corps. The building exhibits a rustic design using wood and stone in keeping with NPS park architecture of the era. The World War II years were a period of empowerment for women that enabled large numbers of women to work outside of the home in the defense industry and in other areas. Gertrude Sawyer put her architectural practice aside to contribute to the war effort, working in the engineering department of Fairchild Aircraft in Hagerstown and later designing living quarters for 14,000 women in the Waves, or Women's Naval Reserve. After the war, 
the suburban housewife was elevated in television, advertising, and other media as an idealized portrayal of the role of women in American society. However, booming economic conditions after 1950, coupled with higher rates of educational attainment for women, resulted in a significant increase in the number of married women in the workforce. While still a minority, uh, growing numbers of women entered the design professions and were working at architectural firms across the country during the early post-war war period, although architecture continued to be associated primarily with men. In an effort to highlight the contributions of women architects, Architectural Record published a series of articles in 1948 on women architects and their work to serve as proof, quote, if any were needed, that architecture is a field where women's talents are being accepted and appreciated. After World War II, AIA Baltimore lifted its membership restrictions and opened to women. The move paralleled similar initiatives at the national level to make the AIA more inclusive of the diverse architects practicing throughout the country. In 1955, Helen Staley became the first woman to join the Baltimore chapter of the AIA. Her work was featured in the AIA Maryland Yearbook in 1955 and 1957. In 1960, Claudio Woodard Smith was elected to the AIA College of Fellows, followed by Victorine dupont Hamsey in 1967. Educational opportunities improved for prospective architecture students in Maryland with the opening of the UMD School of Architecture in 1967. Despite the inclusion of more women in the AIA after World War II, few African-Americans, particularly black women, worked as architects in the US during the 1920 to 1970 period. Exceptions were Martha and Alberta Cassell, daughters of Howard University architect, Albert Cassell. Martha and Alberta were the first African-American women to receive an architecture degree from Cornell University, graduating in 1948 and 1949 respectively. Martha served as chief restoration architect for the National Cathedral in Washington, DC from 1959 until her death in 1968. Alberta forged a career as a naval architect, first with the Naval Research Laboratory and ultimately with the U.S. Naval Sea Systems Command. Helen Ross Staley and her contemporaries worked amid a post-war housing and construction boom that provided opportunities for women architects practicing in the state's rapidly growing suburban communities. Two of the largest post-war developments of single-family homes during this period were Veers Mill Village in Montgomery County and Herondale in Arundel County. In 1949, Helen Ross Staley prepared plans for Herondale Presbyterian Church, located at 1020 Eastway in Glen Burnie. Staley was featured in a Baltimore Sun article about the growing post-war community of Herondale and her design work for the church. In 1957, the church constructed a new modernist sanctuary building, sanctuary building to uh, Staley's designs seen here. <clears throat> Colleges and universities in Maryland experienced a surge of new students after the end of World War II, leading to the construction of new facilities. Catherine Cutler Ficken designed a new dining hall at the University of Maryland College Park, which was completed in 1947. Ficken worked in styles that ranged from the Art Deco to the rustic aesthetic of the Rock Creek Fieldhouse we looked at previously. For the UMD dining hall, she chose a neoclassical design, incorporating an ionic port portico and other classical elements. Between 1940 and 1949, architects Catherine Gibbs and Edwin Wee practiced in Washington under the firm name Wee and Gibbs. The firm primarily designed residential projects, capitalizing on the post-war building boom in the Washington area, enabled by FHA-backed financing. Projects included high-rise apartment buildings, garden apartment complexes, and neighborhoods of detached single-family homes. Pictured is the Oxen Hill Apartments in Hillcrest Heights, an FHA-financed garden apartment complex that originally contained 340 units on a 12-acre site. The three-story brick buildings exhibit clean modern lines and an art deco and, and include art deco accents executed in cast stone, as you can see here in the picture. Women architects in Maryland during the post-war era worked within a context of evolving aesthetic trends and directions. After World War II, 
Architectural modernism served as the idiom for the rapidly growing suburbs of Baltimore and Washington, DC, reflected in new schools, churches, and shopping centers, commercial buildings, and residences. Residential design in particular was an area in which architects in post-war Maryland expressed modern design principles. Architect Clodio Woodard Smith designed a number of noteworthy residences in Montgomery County from the late 1940s to the mid 1950s. These houses are modern in design and exhibit asymmetry, irregular plans, a variety of roof configurations, as well as atypical massing and non-traditional fenestration. The Miller residence pictured here and completed in 1948 is an especially modern design for the period, eschewing traditional massing and ornament in favor of a minimalist expression of rectilinear and box-like building forms joined in an asymmetrical composition. Smith also designed Far Horizons, the St. Michael's, Maryland resident, residence of chemical company executive Frank Washburn. <clears throat> the one-story design with wide eaves, a low-pitched roof, and exposed structural framing was completed in 1957. The house is sited on a waterfront lot facing Snug Harbor, and the house's large windows create a light-filled interior and provide visual connections with the surrounding landscape, a key feature of mid-century house design. The current owners retained architect Charles Goebel. In recent years, he designed a pool house that is compatible with Smith's original design. The Benjamin residence in uh, Bethesda, also designed by Smith and completed in 1966, stands out for its blending of functionality and modern design principles. The design features a merging of the indoor and outdoor experience through curtain walled elevations and walkways, a central courtyard, and a steel deck elevated, elevated above the forested property. Uh, the design has a Messian feel, as you can see here, through the use of black steel columns and trusses, which contrasts with the warmth of the brick cladding, which Smith seamlessly extended into the interior. <clears throat> Husband-wife architectural partnerships is a theme that we continue to see in the post-war period. Shirley Kerr Kennard was a skilled architect and a Cornell graduate who established an architectural practice with her husband, Henry H. Kennard, in 1956 in Washington, DC. The couple primarily engaged in residential and corporate design, as well as uh, small remodeling projects. In 1967, the Kennards uh, began transforming the frame 1920s era bungalow at 4011 Thornapple Street in Chevy Chase into a modern home office. The striking design, which contrasts with the surrounding historic architecture of its setting, features an overhanging second story clad in shingles and pierced by four tall, narrow, <clears throat> asymmetrically placed windows. The design received a Wood Structural Design Award from the National Forest Products Association in 1969. The Kennard Home Office is listed alongside other noteworthy modernist custom homes in Montgomery County by Claire L. Kelly in her book, Montgomery Modern. If you'll just excuse me here for a moment. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, a building by Ilhan and Mezahat Arikoglu. Uh, they were architects who were, uh, uh, who immigrated to the US uh, from Turkey uh, after World War II and established a uh, a uh, practice in the Baltimore area. Uh, they employed a wide range of post-war modernist styles in their work, uh, much of which has been covered in previous virtual history uh, presentations. Uh, this is the uh, WJZ TV studio at 3725 Malden Avenue in Baltimore. It was completed in 1965 and it exhibits a curtain walled front elevation that is recessed behind a row of steel columns supporting the roof overhang. The building's low horizontal modernist form, use of curtain walls, lack of ornament, and exposed structural members are all hallmarks of post-war modernism, particularly the international style. The main lobby still retains elements such as the main stair seen in Nezahata Rikuglu's original drawings. 
just as modernism was transforming architecture in Maryland, <clears throat> the women's liberation movement advocated for a more equitable career landscape for women. And its tremendous impact led to more women entering the field of architecture as professionals. Indicative of this shift, a syndicated feature story on Mary Jack Crago, an architect with the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, appeared in newspapers across the country during the summer of 1966. In 1969, Architectural Forum published a study on sex discrimination in the architectural profession. The study found that women constituted less than 1% of the approximately 20,000 registered architects in the US and represented less than 5% of the architecture students enrolled at US universities. By the early 1970s, the work of women architects had become more visible as a result of studies published in architectural journals and initiatives aimed at highlighting their contributions. Groups <clears throat> such as the WALAP, Women in Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Planning, as well as women's caucuses within the AIA the American Society of Planning Officials and the American Society of Landscape Architects produced statistical surveys concerning discrimination in the areas of salaries and promotion. In 1967, Helen Ross Staley was one of six women professionals that were featured in a Baltimore Sun article entitled, quote, Man's World, Not Anymore, More Power to Women Power. In the article, Staley commented on the challenges of being a woman architect. Quote, when a woman chooses this career, she must, perhaps more than a man, continually prove herself and be prepared to do all the necessary things in addition to her drawings. Dealing with clients, an architect has to know law, psychology, and accounting. I have done my own specifications and secretarial work. In addition, several women architects who were active in Maryland during the post-war period such as Malita Roddick and Poldy Hirsch, were born in Europe and immigrated to the United States where they established architectural practices. These women were educated and in some cases practiced in Central and Southeastern Europe where attitudes and social norms regarding gender and female participation in te technical professions such as architecture and engineering were quite different than what we, what we see in the States during this period. Uh, born in Italy in 1914, Melita Roddick was a 1936 graduate of the architecture program at the Vienna Polytechnic Institute. She immigrated to New York in 1939, and she moved to Washington, D.C. in 1950, where she established a successful architectural practice and became a member of the AIA. Roddick designed a range of building types in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Pictured are her designs for a hangar at, Air, at Andrews Air Force Base in 1955, and a private residence that she designed in Calvert County in 1965. Roddick was involved with a number of nonprofits, and she was the first woman to serve on the DC Board of Examiners and Registrars of Architects. She was elevated to the rank of AIA Member Emeritus in 1986. Poldy Hirsch, a Swiss-trained Israeli architect who practiced in Havre de Grace during the 1960s, will be the focus of a future virtual histories presentation in which we will take an in-depth look at her life and career. So stay, stay tuned for that. In conclusion, women made significant contributions to the built environment of Maryland during the 20th century, despite the fact that they represented only a fraction of practicing architects during this period. The struggle of women designers to obtain higher education and parity with men forms part of the broader social history of women's efforts to achieve greater equality within American society. We hope that our collective research raises greater awareness of women architects and their work in the state of Maryland, and that the multi-property documentation form enables the evaluation and designation of more women designed resources to the National Register of Historic Places. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, John. Sorry, my camera is giving me like a delayed reaction. So I keep accidentally starting it and stopping it. Um, we'll see if it goes. That was fantastic. I know BAF has been excited to partner with EH Traceries and the Maryland Historical Trust to do this one and hopefully uh, another round of surveying. Um, before we get started, if uh, our audience members, if you want to add questions to the Q&A, that would be great. Um, but before I ask my own question that I had, um, Jill Stradling said that um, Rudy Ficken, the son of Catherine Cutler Ficken, is on the call today. So it's very exciting. 
Um, and then I was wondering if there was anything unexpected or surprising that you all have learned in your studies or your um, research and survey so far. It's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I grew up kind of in the 1970s and 80s, and it was very interesting to me to learn the extent to which uh, se sexism and discrimination were so entrenched in, in U.S. society and culture uh, prior to World War II and even after, you know, World War II and the post-war era. And, you know, some of the stats that I presented in the presentation about, uh, even by the 1960s, uh, you know, women only represented a small fraction of practicing architects in the country. And that, that was something that was kind of surprising to me and was, and was really uh, an eye-opener. I think I should know this number since I also work with the AI Baltimore, but I can't think of what the current relation is, but I know it's still, it's still, still low. Yeah. Still, still low. Yep. Um, can you recommend any resources for learning about early women uh, in Maryland architecture? I am interested, uh, this is one of our guests, I'm interested in Anna L. Hawkins and her work in, on the 19, ooh, 1896 Harvard of Grace High School. There's no mention of her I can find in um, an architectural history of Harvard County, Maryland. So that looks like it might be a book or an article. Yeah, um, there, you know, she was really an enigma to research. Um, it was kind of frustrating. I was hoping that I could have found more about her and her career. <clears throat> we know that she attended school in New York. Uh, she excelled in that program that she attended in New York and actually won some awards, not just for architectural competitions, but also for art, for art mm -hmm. that she had done. Uh, and then she just kind of falls off the radar. I did a considerable amount of research to try to locate her in the historical record. And the only thing I can really uh, uh, deduce is that she married and changed her name quite possibly. Uh, but uh, I did find an article, I believe it was published in, uh, I think it may have been published in Frank Leslie's uh, that mentioned her. Okay. But if but I, if you want to find that article, one good way to find it would be to go onto the uh, Making of America database by Columbia by uh, Cornell University, which has all of those uh, those early journals, late nineteenth century journals, and just plug her name in, and you should be able to pull it up. Actually, I I, I want to commend John. You actually getting the story of Hawkins because we did not know of her when we did the exhibit. And I was so excited because she's the earliest then we know of because a lot of the women we 20, 1920s was the earliest we had found. So that was impressive. And then you were also able to find more about, I think Getty, Getty, K Catherine Gibbs. She changed her name a couple of times and we kept losing sight of her and we couldn't end up putting her in the exhibit either. And I saw that you were able to find some more so, you know, that's what happens is, um, in fact, the exhibit we put out, we refer to all the women by their first names because their names kept changing or, or they were related to their husbands or, or, or fathers who were architects and it would get so confusing on the exhibit board. So we, we end up calling everybody by their first names, which made it a lot more familiar. We, a lot of us who worked on the early research, we just felt like we got to know know them better and a lot of the work a lot of what we learn came from the children because it's not always documented in the public sphere what these women did and and like for instance Catherine Cutler Ficken and we have Rudy on the call I mean he was indispensable for us to know about his mom um, because he had her portfolio and was able to share um, information about her life that we would not have been able to know. So it really, it really made it a labor of love to sort of uncover these stories. So we're so excited that Traceries and the Maryland Historic Trust has continued to work to actually then document the, the designs they did and then get them, you know, um, registered. I think that's just incredible. It's been great. Did, right. if, if no one has questions, do is, is would would Rudy is he willing to say hello? 
Um, Unfortunately, it was no. set up in the webinar mode. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Then you're right. I know. I know. If I'd known um, that you had registered, we would have could have made you also a presenter, so you could have spoken. But um, yeah, unfortunately, with webinar mode, our audience is unable to mute, which is the reason we have it um, for unruly audience members. But. Um, <laughs> Um, so I know that the next one in two weeks will be on Poldy Hirsch and we will, we, we do have the possibility of having one of her daughters on. So I'll try to get that information to you ahead of time. But um, I'm just curious for the, if we were to proceed with work, what, what in your estimation, John, is, a, is one of the projects most noteworthy to look at? Um, do you have one in mind? Um, just the public might want to know or for, for Poldy Hirsch or no just for any of them but yeah certainly by for, for Poldy if you have one in mind that you like oh it's such a hard question <laughs> so many great they're, they're very different I'm, so it is hard yeah. to cross compare them yeah yeah uh I'm really a fan of the Homsey's work unfortunately the Cambridge Club has kind of been has been altered uh and a lot of their really strong international style work was in Delaware, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they have, it is amazing, uh, Victorine dupont Holmesy has about 20 projects on the Eastern Shore that many people don't know of. So uh, there is vestiges, there's a barn in one location and, and a riding track in another. And so you can find pieces of that. Um, but yes, it's a story that's not been fully told yet. Uh, yeah. we did a question that came in, sorry. Um, I just wanted to be able to answer this question before we run too long. Was the lack of women architects due to schools not accepting them, schools of architecture, or firms not hiring? Really good question. Uh, and Julian, feel free to weigh in here. But I think from our research, what we kind of uh, uh, determined was that it, the trend seemed to be uh, a lot of sexism that existed in society at the time, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these women were highly educated and then just struggled to establish their careers. It just was kind of a boys club um, uh, that you, that you saw. Uh, you yeah, know, it was it, a boys it, club it, for, yeah. for not just women, for anyone. A lot of fields. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean like if you weren't white and <laughs> male, it, it was that hard too. to break into it because because architecture is a profession that requires money to produce and so you have to know people of money and that that was harder to do if you were sort of not in that element in in society to begin with so a number of the women we studied did were from wealthier families which gave them a little bit more of an in like the Victorine de Bona Homsey they 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 started their firm at the start of the depression I mean most it's like, but they were able to do it because of all their contacts with the DuPont family. And they did a lot of summer homes and stuff like that. So I do think it has to do with not having the connections to the people that could afford an architect and not being hired by firms. Um, I know in even the work we did of the later women, I remember people coming up to me during our talks and said, I was in school and I had professors say, there's just no way I'm graduating that woman. You know, like, 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 like that was just from like, not that long ago, 20 years ago. So, I mean, it's, it is, it is, it is completely changed though. The profession has now become in schools. It's more than half are women, but it, it's taken a long time. And it's the other one, little interesting tidbit I'll share is when um, for Nisa Hot's son, who was on one of the virtual histories, he said that in Turkey, it's now architecture is even being seen as a female trade. And it's the engineers are seen as the male. He says, because it's become so much more commonplace for women to be in it. So I just find it's fascinating how society kind of sets these agendas that then have to be broken. But I appreciate all the work that you've done and your firm to highlight and find out more. Thank you. Well, we, we built upon the great work that, that you guys did before us. I was just going to add to on that question. Uh, one, one other thing that we found was that uh, a lot of it varied by locale. So, you know, New York City was more of a culturally progressive place. 
uh, during the 20th century, and a lot of women found more success there than also on the West Coast than, than in other places. I know Claudia Woodard Smith. Yeah, yeah, NBC, right? Yeah. I know Claudia Woodard Smith spent some of her early career working for some big New York firms. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, John and EHT Traceries for this work you are doing. We are excited for um, our next virtual history in two weeks. I did drop the link in the chat for you to register on the life and work of Goldie Persh. Um, oh, Helen Ross is on the call too. Yes. I, it's not the Helen Staley Ross, Ross. No, maybe it's a different Ross, but <laughs> Helen is also living. She's one of the ones in the exhibit um who is still um no no, no relation right. sorry um, yeah she's still living and she, we actually did a virtual history with her um so we could yeah, yeah. um are you did you were you able to post a link to the past virtual histories um i did not do that i can try well, to it's easy it. enough folks can go to youtube baltimore architecture foundation virtual histories and there's past ones. And anyway, Helen was uh, interviewed on one of them. So it's great. She's nine and she's no, she's 101 now. <laughs> right. I just put in the YouTube in the in the chat. Um, thank you all for joining us this week. And we will see you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye.